Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning in the US. Uh, uh, good afternoon in uh, the UK and Europe and good late evening or whatever time it is around Asia. Um, I'm told we have people who have registered uh, from all over the world. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is a panel, uh, as you know, entitled Modern Anti-Slavery and Transparent Supply Lines Building Back Freer After Christies. Uh, I'm David Blight. I'm the director of the Gilderam Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition at Yale University. I teach American history here at Yale and the history of slavery. Um, the Gilder Lerman Center is now 21 years old. Uh, we do many activities around the problem of slavery and its uh, many abolitions and its many legacies across all borders and all time. And for approximately eight or nine years now, we have been conducting a major initiative on the study uh, and activism against modern slavery and forms of human trafficking. Uh, I wanna first uh, simply thank our team here that has helped put on this, uh, this technological feat of a panel that is international and from all corners of the United States. Uh, Song Kim, who is a graduate student at the Yale School of Management has been a huge uh, force and help in conceiving this and helping us put it together. Daniel Vera is our technology uh, master uh, at, at the Gilda Lehrman Center. And I want to especially thank Daniel for all his work on this. And my colleagues, Lou DeBaca and Kate Cooney, uh, whom I'll introduce uh, in a bit, uh, help conceive this entire panel. Um, at the GLC, um, we have, as I said, for many years, tried to harness history, the law, the social sciences, literature, technology, and about any other discipline you might think of to create knowledge about current forms of exploited labor, of sex trafficking, and, and as well as the international fight to com combat this system. Um, we have an extraordinary panel uh, to engage these issues today, but this is a panel especially about the problem of practicing ethics out there in the world of business and production and manufacturing um, and the transparency with which businesses can either choose to or be forced to deal with their own involvements in forms of exploited labor or even enslaved labor. We are talking, in other words, about the most vulnerable workers in the world, and there are millions of them. And unfortunately, in this particular moment, in this COVID-19 international crisis, they've become more vulnerable than ever. Um, just uh, within the past week, the International Labor Organization put out a study that estimated that approximately 1.6 billion workers in the world uh, have just fallen into some degree of unemployment and therefore increased vulnerability to further kinds of exploitation. And those of you who read the New York Times will note that today on page one, there's a feature article that raises that number to even 2 billion workers across the globe, especially all over South Asia and Africa, many of whom have managed to rise to some degree out of poverty uh, in the past 25 to 30 years uh, due to the work of many organizations and governments and companies, uh, but just now in, in overnight terms in historical time have fallen into potentially a new form of destitution, poverty, and vulnerability. That is a number that is very hard to get your head around. The two billion people, uh, laborers, are right now suffering uh, the possibility of utter exploitation 
and even uh, malnutrition or starvation. Now, uh, on this panel, we're going to address this uh, difficult issue with some amazing people and amazing experts. Um, our panelists include a representative of the leading philanthropic funder um, of anti-slavery action and of, and of harnessing investors to understand and how to clean up the supply chains in manufacturing around the world. We also will include here a software developer who challenges businesses and consumers to deal with what has become known as their slavery footprint. And then thirdly, a leading human rights policy maker who spearheaded the development of transparency to ensure culprit, uh, corporate uh, responsibility. Our commentator at the end is one of the world's leading political scientists who for approximately a decade now has studied through some extraordinary field work um, in plantations uh, producing coffee and tea and other products, the vast problem of supply chains and exploited labor. Uh, I want to say also at the outset, there's a feature at the bottom of this technology that says Q&A, and we, will, we welcome you to submit questions throughout the panel. Uh, we're running this for two hours. You can submit the questions. Uh, Song Kim is going to be uh, curating those questions and uh, preparing them for what we hope is a good robust half hour at the end of uh, questions from the world audience. Let me, as quick as I can, then introduce uh, our two moderators, my colleagues here at Yale, and then the three panelists, and then we'll get right to it. Lucy DeBaca uh, is a U.S. ambassador. Ambassador DeBaca is senior fellow right now in modern slavery here at the GLC and is teaching both in the undergraduate curriculum and in the Yale Law School. In the Obama administration, he was many things, but he was senior advisor to Secretary of State Clinton on uh, trafficking in persons. Uh, in the 1990s, he pioneered litigation in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, particularly on cases against trafficking and hate crimes. He created a victim-centered approach to such litigation and particularly to the use of the 13th Amendment. In, the, in which in the U.S. is the amendment abolishing slavery in those litigations. He received all kinds of the highest awards from both the State Department and the Justice Department. Um, and I, again, I want to thank Lou for helping conceive this entire panel. And he's been uh, terrific to have here as a colleague, I must say. Uh, Kate Cooney is my colleague in the Yale School of Management. She's senior lecturer in social enterprise and management. Her work uh, has for years now been on problems of urban poverty. She studies corporate supply chain transparency. She studies economic development and strategies in American cities. She studies social enterprise. She's written widely about the alleviation of poverty by market-based methods. And she is especially now working on this issue of ethics in corporate transparency and how they employ or use labor. She is with Lou DeBaca, the co-director of a project based on a grant that we got at the GLC and School of Management from Yale's Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies and that project is entitled Consumer Activism and Supply Chain Transparency, um, Anti-Slavery Movements in the U.S. and the U.K. And it's out of that effort that this panel was conceived. Uh, Kate and Lou will be our moderators of the panel about to um, begin. Let me introduce the panelists, and I think this is in the order they will speak. Justin Dillon is the founder and CEO of FRDM or Freedom. Um, he has also created the organization Made in the Free World. He created software for businesses to manage risk in supply chains, and he's worked with many Fortune 500 companies in doing this. Uh, he created a network of companies focused on 
ending forced labor and child labor across the world. He founded the nonprofit Slavery Footprint, and he is a film director. He directed the documentary film entitled Call and Response. Um, and maybe that film will indeed come up in our discussions. Allison Keel Friedman uh, is Executive Director of International Corporate Accountability Roundtable, ICAR, in case you hear that acronym during the discussion. Uh, she uh, leads an effort pushing governments to create and enforce rules over corporations to advance human rights and reduce inequality. There are 40 members in this organization. She helped to author the California Transparency and Supply Chains Law, the first of its kind. And in the Obama administration, she was deputy director in the State Department of the Office to Combat Human Trafficking and worked indeed with Ambassador Labaca, uh, Debaca, excuse me. Uh, she also created the website uh, Slavery Footprint and she helped lead a, lead a lot of frontline diplomacy conducted with Pakistan and other countries on these issues and has even recently run for Congress in the 10th District of Virginia. And then our last panelist is Killian Moot. He's the director of Humanity United, which is one of the world's most important uh, organizations uh, fighting modern forms of slavery. He's an expert in responsible business and investment strategies. Um, his organization works on all aspects of labor relations and impact investing. He currently leads the uh, group uh, and the effort called Know the Chain, uh, which is a leading risk index about global supply chain. This is an extraordinary group of panelists who have been for years working on these issues, not just of generally fighting modern forms of slavery, but particularly this issue of exploited labor, the supply chains of international production, of all kinds of commodities, which is where many, much of the worst of this practice has taken place for decades. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lou and to Kate. I will return later to introduce Genevieve LeBaron, our commentator, and then have a few remarks uh, as well at the end. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, and enjoy this panel. And remember on the Q&A feature at the bottom, you are more than welcome to submit questions um, to us and we will get as many of those questions in as we can at the end. So Kate. I think it's over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David, and welcome, everyone. I just want to spend a few minutes giving you a little more background on the origins of this webinar. Uh, the webinar, as David said, is connected to a project underway being led by David, Lou, and myself to study anti slavery supply chain transparency laws. So, as part of this study, which is supported by funding from the Macmillan Center here at Yale, we were planning on traveling this spring and summer to collect oral histories, to record and preserve the experiences of key players in the development of the leading supply chain transparency instruments, which are the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act of 2010 and the UK Modern Slavery Act of 2015. Our aim was to establish an archive that will allow for the comparative analyses of domestic and international regulatory regimes and the ac activisms that surround them. Due to COVID-19, like so many of you, our, our travel plans have been appended. So we've reconvened here and we're so excited to have all of you joining us. Uh, as Lou will explain, we've structured today's conversations to reflect on these advocacy efforts of the past, the Supply Chains Act in California is almost 10 years old now, but to do so with a focus on the lessons learned for the current moment. And the current moment is one in which, as David said, the extreme vulnerabilities of workers are in full view. Essential workers in healthcare and retail and delivery are being asked to go to work without adequate protections. <laughs> 
domestic workers who clean houses, provide elder care and child care, are being let go without pay en masse. In Brazil, the mines are still operating, even as restaurants are closed. In Morocco, workers are being called to work in crowded conditions in call centers. Uh, the same is true for Indian garment workers. And in Bangladesh, according to a study that came out of the University of Pennsylvania, something on the order of 2 million workers are now out of work, uh, which is connected to the 3 billion orders that have been canceled and companies who are not paying for the textiles already purchased for those orders. So I think that what we're gonna to do to, to draw attention to uh, those problems and some of the solutions uh, for that uh, rather daunting um, uh, process of uh, what's going on around the world um, is have this panel do a little bit of double duty uh, today. Uh, we're looking at the transparency movement um, and what it means now, where it came from, how it might be a way forward in building a new global business model as a result of uh, and in response to this crisis. As always, I think that we need to talk about what we're talking about. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of con contestation around uh, what slavery is, what trafficking is, uh, what it, it means uh, to use those words in the modern era. Um, and whether you call it slavery, forced labor, human trafficking, um, what we're talking about is all uh, coercive and abusive labor systems. Uh, we'll examine those systems uh, and the way forward uh, and how we got here today with three folks who are on the front lines uh, and go back to the early years of this and the development specifically of the California uh, Act and since. Um, what we're going to ask of the panelists is to do uh, 10 minutes on kind of what you are doing and what your organization is doing to fight modern slavery, how you got into this work and why you stayed in, um, and how uh, COVID-19 is starting uh, to uh, affect what you're doing. Uh, we'll be spending a lot more time, I think, on uh, the uh, pandemic uh, throughout the Q&A uh, as we go on. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, and turn it over uh, to Allison Friedman, um, who is going to start us off. Allison? Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I... Uh, so I run the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable, which has you know, 40 plus member organizations that have come together around advocacy and communications for corporate accountability. Um, I thought I'd do just a quick run through of some of the different ways we've seen um, modern slavery connected to supply chains. So, so this boy is a boy I met in the DRC. Um, he is mining coltan long after Dodd-Frank passed um, for a mine owner that is an elected official in the DRC. And when I asked um, watching a number of children in toil in this mine, um, what, whether about children and forced labor um, in mines, the, the elected official said, well, the law says we can't do that. Um, and it was, one of many examples of the lack of connectivity between the law and what's going on on the ground. Next slide. Uh, this is a miner I met in Peru who was mining for gold. Um, and he separated the gold from the other minerals by swirling the rocks and mercury in his mouth and then spitting it out. And the picture you see on the right hand side is, it's hard to get a sense of scale, but that's football fields wide in the middle of the Amazon that's just been deadened um, by the mercury. Next slide. These are fishermen from Myanmar who had been um, enslaved on Thai fishing vessels for a series of years. They, the power went out while we were talking, so everybody held up their cell phones. Um, but they would tell stories about how they were only allowed to sleep two hours a night, but sometimes after pulling in 
thousands of pounds of fish, again, for markets that, that we use um, by hand over two miles of rope, their arms would hurt so badly that they couldn't sleep at all for, for three days. Next slide. Uh, these are children who had been working in agriculture in northern India. Um, they learned about their rights in this school, filed a complaint with the local magistrate to make sure that their parents were paid in currency rather than in rice. Next slide. Um, and this, I think, is particularly important right now. Um, this was the right hand side is returning migrant workers um in indonesia and and the left hand side is an advertisement that was placed in malaysian papers that i think speaks to how quickly we discount people's humanity next slide so um those are all modern stories um this i think there's a story i heard about george washington that i think is particularly instructive um, for where we go from here, policy-wise. Uh, George Washington knew slavery was wrong, wrote a lot about it privately, uh, lacked the courage to do much about it um, while he was alive, uh, but had committed to freeing all of his slaves when he died, um, as had his wife. And this is a story the ambassador and I learned together at Mount Vernon. Um, George Washington predeceased Martha Washington, all of his slaves were freed. Um, Martha Washington's slaves on Mount Vernon continued enslaved until Abigail Adams wrote her a letter um, that's, that asked her to consider the wisdom of having people who were enslaved wait, pre wait, who prepared her food waiting on her death for their freedom. Um, and with Upon receipt of the letter, Martha Washington freed her slaves the next day. And so I think, you know, it's incumbent upon all of us, as much as I wish it weren't always true, to align um, the values of freedom with people's individual interests to move progress forward. Next slide. Um, so you've heard a little bit about the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act. Uh, you know, it, it, what the bill functionally did was require any corporation doing $100 million worth of sales internationally and $50 worth of business in the state of California to publicly disclose what their policies were to, related to human trafficking and whether or not they were independently audited. Um, and, and functionally, that bill set a bar that every corporation needs to consider it. It required a public posting. Um, and the, and, and, and so you'll see on the right hand side, there are a number of companies who had never had to consider or publicly speak about the risk within their supply chain um, that now had to. Next slide. I think that set an important baseline, um, and, but, but it required companies to functionally do nothing other than be transparent. And, and what we, so in the California's Transparency and Supply Chains Bill, companies could say, look, we don't care and we do nothing um, and be in compliance with the law. What, what the ambassador um, and I worked on in the Obama administration was to move that one step forward and start leveraging governments and companies purchasing power to incentivize freedom around the world in what, what is the world's largest supply chain, which is the US governments. And so the President Obama's executive order on strengthening protections um, meaningfully moved you know, and scaled demand for responsible sourcing practices. Next slide, please. Um, here in this slide, you see the a cabinet meeting and Ambassador Sitabaka on the left. Um, the UN peacekeeping mission in the DRC and then an EU convening 
on the right hand side. And, and I think both within governments and within corporations, there is kind of a default to the way things have always been done. Um, and there's, and, and if we look back at history, and I know others will speak to this, there are times of great tumults that have given way to a chance to reimagine the systems. And I, I've reflected a lot on the Audre Lorde quote that, um, you know, the tools, you know, the tools of, ins I'm going to butcher it at this moment, but, but kind of the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I think as we go forward and look at COVID, there are a lot of examples, both historical and related to global shifts and norms that, that we need to consider going forward, given the increased vulnerability and the vulnerability that we already knew existed that we've seen exacerbate these public health issues. Next slide, please. Um, so here are just a few examples from domestic work to manufacturing, we know also in agriculture um, and other industries where forced labor is more acute um, and, and the risk is greater now. Next slide, please. Um, so one thing I'm looking forward to talking about as, as we go forward is there is a model um, out there in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act about how we held corporations accountable for actions throughout their supply chain where knowledge was not a prerequisite for accountability and the United States led and global norms shifted. And, and now the, a vast majority of the business community endorses the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act as something that has helped ensure reliable business processes and trade throughout the world. And I think, um, and, and at base, what the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act does is hold corporations accountable for bribes that are played and that are paid within their supply chain. Um, and, and I think one of the questions that, that we need to pose to government leaders and and there has been a lot of work in the EU and elsewhere on mandatory human rights due diligence is aren't grave human rights abuses at least as worthy of government action and protection as bribery and isn't this time of having to reimagine rebuild and strengthen systems an important time to start addressing the opportunity and the the kind of responsibility that I think we haven't been upholding within you know a, a globalized marketplace. Thank you, Allison, and, and thank you for showing us how I think the combination of uh, real world uh, experiences that workers are going through, um, and then the possibilities of government uh, action and government regulation uh, can drive things forward. We often hear about um, you know, harnessing the power of the, of the corporate sector. Um, sometimes that seems like it's being done to prevent uh, governments from regulating. Um, and I think you've shown us how the two uh, can actually uh, supplement and, and help each other. And I think that brings us to Killian. Uh, Killian, you're really you know, kind of living that. Uh, I don't know if that's what you uh, thought uh, more than 10 years ago when you started working on this. Uh, that you would end up doing, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing over at HU? Yeah, great. Thank you, Ambassador. It's, it's great to be here, and thanks for facilitating such a timely and important uh, discussion. Um, so I work for Humanity United. We're a private foundation that's been dedicated in part to addressing forced labor, human trafficking for, for over a decade, and it's been a real privilege uh, to have in some way, shape, or form my uh, career consistently touch the work of Humanity United and, and be with you colleagues here. Um, one of the efforts that I oversee for us is an initiative called Know the Chain, uh, which really emerged after the initial passage of uh, the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. And the intention was to take the information that was being made available by corporations to analyze it, identify what is leading practice and, and what corporations need to be doing. Um, a lot of these laws just say they have to state what they're doing rather than 
dictating what they should do. Uh, so we, we took the opportunity to create the initiative uh, in part to inform investors and companies on what is leading practice and appropriate in terms of responding to these different compliance requirements. So today we're backed up by a network of investors that represent about five trillion of assets under management. And they use our information that we provide to engage the companies that are in uh, their investment portfolios. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, we find ourselves at a really interesting moment uh, in which, uh, in many ways for consumers, the, the idea of the supply chain has never been more important and critical. Um, and they're considering things that they never previously considered, which is how are the, the products that they're purchasing made. Uh, and so I think it, it really behooves us that are in this moment to not only focus on the how, but the who, uh, and emphasize the importance of those conditions for workers uh, throughout the entire global supply chain system uh, that are producing goods that consumers are buying. Um, and I think in particular today, it's even more poignant. Today is the International Labor Day. Uh, for those of us in the U U.S., it's May Day. For everyone else in the world, it's Labor Day. Uh, but we in the U.S. like to do things always a little bit different. Um, so I think it's really important and poignant to even call that out, right? A lot of these conversations that we've had are going to be from that top down. How do we hold companies accountable through policy and law? But you can't effectively do that if you don't have a powerful and stable uh, organizing function of labor. Uh, and so we really need to acknowledge that in this space moving forward, we need to have that discussion more acutely and specifically. Um, so, you know, the emergence of global supply chains and the acceleration um, has really, you know, emerged over a number of decades. A few factors to just call out that has really accelerated this is that corporations as free trade agreements started to, to emerge, uh, started to trade off this idea of control uh, to, to lean into complexity uh, and to give themselves greater flexibility. And what that led to is this situation which you start seeing emerge uh, companies dis having widely distributed supply chains in which they're favoring global labor arbitrage, looking for lowest cost labor markets to really reduce their costs. And, and by doing that, what they trade in, 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 for it is basically leverage, control, uh, and essentially creating opacity. So no longer are they able to really have full sight uh, into their entire supply chains. They might have a relationship with direct suppliers, but deeper into the supply chain and farther upstream they go, the less they have visibility and an understanding of what those labor conditions really look like for workers. Um, and so really um, what we've seen is this emergence of, of efforts to, to hold companies accountable, respond to this global dynamic where multinational corporations were responding to the trade incentives that they might have to give themselves maximum flexibility and shift labor costs from a fixed cost to a highly variable cost. Um, and that in part has also been incentivized by investors. So we need to acknowledge that investors have, as they shifted to short-termism, they've created a dynamic where companies don't hold a lot of cash on hand. Uh, and that is creating these really significant impacts right now that we're feeling acutely within the global labor movement. Uh, next slide, please. So Allison talked about you know, the, the setting of the stage of this, this discussion around transparency and re the reporting trend that we see to merge and what might, you might call like the transparency meme or the reporting meme, which is just an idea that adapts itself and improves. Um, it started in California, it moved over to the UK. Uh, we're seeing different variations of the similar component. Uh, just yesterday, the EU uh, announced the desire to pass an EU directive that related to mandatory human rights due diligence. Due diligence is different from what we're talking about here, but it is another meme or iteration of this concept of how do you create regulation that holds companies accountable for their activities and actions that are happening outside of the country of origin in which they are domiciled? How do you actually create a, an accountability mechanism that that pins their responsibility in some way for their contribution to the problems that we're seeing in the world today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we mentioned this, Catherine mentioned this acutely in the beginning, but we're already seeing uh, some supply chain disruptions immediately and then also some long-term impacts. I think it's really important for us, particularly those that are privileged enough like myself to work from home, that the impact that the majority of workers are gonna feel is not just about infection rates from a COVID, but from the long-term economic implications of this se serious disruption. Um, so we, what we have done at, as Know the Chain uh, and others that are doing as well is really to attempt to engage different sectors and different companies on what their responsibility looks like for how they've contributed to the global system that we're currently in and making sure that workers are protected in this moment. Um, one of these acute and most more approximate impacts was the Bangladesh garment factory uh, industry, where we saw, as Catherine mentioned, nearly 2 million workers immediately out of work. 
and, a, and multiple different brands refusing to pay their suppliers for purchase orders that they had already placed. Um, it's an interesting point in which we're now talking about something like purchasing practices. For those of us that have been working in this field for a long time, the idea of purchasing practices and the importance of them might not have been as acute or aware for the majority of people, but now we're seeing how purchasing practices really can drive risk and contribute to the potential um, situation in which workers are exploiting and taking advantage of. So what we've done is know the chain is we've analyzed um, you know, a, a set of 43 different companies and provided that data, data to investors. And we're now working with the Investor Alliance, uh, the Investor Alliance for Human Rights and the, investor, uh, the ICCR network to um, engage apparel companies on their specific responsibility as it relates to the COVID crisis. Um, there's another great organization out there, the Worker Rights Consortium, which is keeping a running list of which companies have actually committed to paying suppliers for purchase orders, orders that they made and those that are not. Um, if you're interested in this, I, I recommend you, you engage further in that discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to the immediate impacts that we saw through the apparel sector, uh, we're also seeing this impact more acutely at home here in the United States, at least, uh, where there's emerging supply chain disruptions within the food processing industry. Um, one of our reports that we put out as Know the Chain was to analyze last year, um, 39 of the largest food uh, and beverage manufacturers. What we, what we found in terms of how they're approaching this issue of labor risk is that of all the companies we analyzed, only 25% of those companies actually demonstrated that they remediated abuse when a known abuse has happened in their supply chain. Simultaneously, only 10% of those companies, the 39 that we analyzed, had some demonstration that they had a grievance mechanism in place that could be used by workers, demonstrated that it was actually used, right? And so the situation that this creates for us now is that we have a huge percentage of workers in the global workforce and in the United States that are highly vulnerable and susceptible uh, to likely abuse. Um, and in those conditions, while we, we don't know acutely exactly how many workers are likely gonna be affected, we know that the conditions in which these workers operate in today, as of right now, even before COVID's full impact is known, is creating a high vulnerability for them. And we have US policymakers discussing right now the idea of, of relaxing wage requirements and wage payment to some of these most vulnerable workers, which is only going to exacerbate the likely impact and risk that these workers might fall uh, to, to severe labor abuse uh, in, in the next year or so as we economically try to recover from the impact of COVID. Uh, next slide, please. These are just a few other stats I wanted to highlight um, that really relates to this, this desire to to have a wholesale response uh, from the private sector in, in response to COVID. Um, so through our research at Know the Chain, last year we analyzed 119 companies in food and beverage, apparel and footwear, and high tech and IC, IC, ICT. Uh, what we found is that the majority, 57% of those companies, did not have a grievance mechanism available for their supplier workers. Uh, what that means is that if, if a violation, a worker rights violation occurs on the workplace, that individual worker isn't able to voice it. Um, as we see these disruptions, things like grievance mechanisms are so fundamental and critical because those workers who are able to voice complaints are the front lines that are gonna be able to give us an indication of how severe a potential disruption might actually be. Uh, furthermore, of those 119 companies that we looked at, only 12% showed that, that that evidence, that that mechanism was actually used by the workers themselves. So while a mechanism might exist, not a lot of companies are actually demonstrating that workers are using it itself. So not only do we need to make sure that these grievance mechanisms exist, we need to actually make sure that they're, they're utilized. Uh, and there might be reasons for why that's the case, uh, but this conversation really needs to shift towards making sure that a basic fundamental level of rights are observed for workers. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, you know, there is a lot of conversation that we've had uh, as a global community about the need for legislation and, and requirements that hold companies accountable. But fundamentally at the, at the other end of this is that we do also need to have a constructive dialogue around what are we doing to ensure that we workers have the, the freedom to associate or collectively bargain for what they believe to be uh, the necess necessity of their own rights. If we don't have that base structure set up globally or in different countries in which production is occurring, 
then we're never able, never going to be able to fully understand or know the extent to which uh, workers are protected. Um, so finally, last stat that I would like to highlight here is that our, our report again looked at 119 companies and of those companies, only 15% of them uh, said that their suppliers, that they supported their suppliers uh, in an effort to ensure that freedom of association uh, was occurring within the work sites. Um, so th this really gets to the fundamental question of if we want to create an environment in the future in which workers are protected, uh, while it is really, really critical to have mechanisms like transparency laws uh, and reporting regulations and human rights due diligence to hold companies accountable, we also need to have a conversation about how we help support uh, the workers themselves to be able to collectively organize and ensure that their own rights are protected and observed in the context of their work workplaces. Um, you know, a really important stat that David highlighted up front is that you know, the ILO came out with a report that said over a billion workers themselves, over half the global workforce, is in some way experiencing economic impact from this crisis, right? That is likely gonna accelerate um, exploitation. It creates greater vulnerability. And so we need to have a, a conversation now about how we go uh, forward and where we go from here. Um, and I'm really excited about this discussion and looking forward to, to getting into the question and answer. So thank you, Lou. Thank you, Killian. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that we see from, from your presentation is that um, when you start looking um, at these things or you start asking the companies to look at these things, uh, the, the story that's being told is not necessarily a, a, a rosy picture, but it's, it's a picture. And maybe the reason that it hasn't been told or that it hasn't been seen for a long time is because uh, folks maybe instinctively knew what they might look at or what they might find if they started to look under the hood. Um, and, and so with that in mind, I wanted to, to turn to Justin uh, as far as kind of the making that possibility real. You know, this idea of uh, knowing the chain um, that you can do with an outside uh, company or an outside group uh, that's going to do analytics uh, from afar, uh, I think kind of begs the question as to whether the companies themselves know their own chains. Uh, and I know that you've been uh, really trying to unpack that, Justin. Could you take us uh, on a tour through that? Yeah, happy to. Um, it's a real pleasure to get to um, join my uh, uh, Partners Against Crime uh, on this call this morning. Um, it uh, uh, gives me a lot of um, uh, warm memories and, and, and excitement to get to come together and, and um, fight alongside everyone uh, again. Um, Lou and, and Allison and I uh, have been, uh, have done quite a bit in, in this space. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I always suffer from the probably the greatest amount of imposter syndrome, but to some degrees, you know, Lou and Allison have have have, uh, have bravely stepped into spaces that, um, you know, that um, are new to them as well. And I think we've some of the things that we're seeing here, <laughs> laws being changed and whatnot, are due to the bravery of of a lot of the people on the call. Killian as well, it's just incredible. Um, you know, the, the the way that that Lou and Allison and I came together, working together, was through creating Slavery Footprint, which was. Um, uh, if, if no one's, uh, if anyone's ever heard of it, it's an online survey that can tell you how many slaves it takes to run your life, which for the federal government to fund a question like that uh, takes incredible bravery. Um, and uh, our intention was to get 150,000 people to get an answer to that question and give ourselves a year. We gave ourselves a year, which was nearly impossible, uh, but we reached our year goal in an hour. And to date, over 50 million people know the answer to that question. Um, and that really sparked something inside of me. I kind of felt like we found a vein. Um, sure, we got five minutes of people's attention uh, all around the world in every country but North Korea. But what it, it did was it, it was kind of a case study in change, right? That, and I believe that change is something, um, I believe that we, you know that change is working when it becomes boring. Um, when it just becomes standardized and it kind of, kind of works. And you look at the map of, of how laws are being passed around the world, um, you look at the way that Killian and his team have been able to uh, operationalize optics uh, for investors. Um, some of the stuff just looks very, very normal. And it wasn't five or six years ago. This was very not normal. So in order to create change in the world, um, you have to both have will and a way to be able to create change, but you also have to have timing. And I think what the conversation today around COVID-19, a lot of the conversation today is around timing. What is, what is being asked of us now? Um, what is timing saying? Maybe it's a little bit too early, but we know that for everyone that's on this call, uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of will, 
And um, with some of the things that you're seeing, you're seeing some, some ways in which you can create change. And for the small postage stamp way that our company has decided, decided to create changes through the use of a company spend data. Um, we take an approach uh, as a software company that it's really hard to fix something you can't measure. And supply chains are very hard to measure. Killian gave a great example of how absolutely uh, the, the data points are just absolutely fall apart, usually inside of procurement systems. I, I, I know companies that are working with procurement system softwares where they have their spend data across 20 different systems. I mean, this is just, this is like uh, the New Jersey healthcare uh, system where you've got everything's in COBOL. Like it's, 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 it's spend data is, is traditionally been a real mess. Um, but in order for us to create change and understand some of these problems, especially if you want to operate, operationalize it at a business level, you have to be able to measure the problem. And that's really what we as a company uh, set out to do. If we can organize this information, we can create step change. So we, we kind of focus on the way part of it because we've seen enough will in this space. Um, this picture is a, is a young girl that I met in Jharkhand, India, in, uh, Jharkhand, India, East India. She's sitting on a pile of mica. Uh, she actually, that's, she's wearing her work clothes. Uh, that's what she mines this mica in. Um, and she's just small enough to climb down little rat hole um, mines in order to take her prehistoric tools and uh, scrape the stuff out of the earth. Uh, oftentimes, uh, those, uh, those holes will collapse. Um, I, there's children everywhere her age that do this. That mica ends up going into global supply chains and ends up becoming sparkles and makeup and automotive paint and in the bottoms of irons and everywhere else. And when you see stories like this, um, it's something that makes me want to figure out how can we connect the dots? Because there isn't anyone on this call and there isn't anyone that I work with, there isn't anyone that I've met that doesn't care about her story. But the way in which we connect those dots is something that our company has tried to connect not just stories, but be able to connect uh, supply chains. Next slide. Um, so for us, uh, the way that we do that um, is looking directly at the problem. As I said before, um, most companies don't have optics uh, into their supply chain. And this really is a technological problem. Um, as we've seen globalization expand, supply chains have become harder and harder to look at. And the 20th century versions of being able to handle some of these things just aren't enough. And we're going we're gonna to talk hopefully a little bit later about the sea change of, of corporate social responsibility and how it needs to more move inside of the spine of operations and outside of, um, of sustainability and outside in the periphery. But essentially, uh, the position that we need is we need 20, 21st century tools to handle 21st century problems. Next slide. Um, I'm a storyteller. I love stories. Uh, I think everything's a story, and the story that our company uh, 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 is entering into is one in which um, we actually believe that um, in, in every story there's a hero, the hero has a problem, the hero meets a guy who gives them a plan and calls that hero to action, and that either leads in, uh, it hopefully leads in success and uh, helps them to avoid failure. Every story you can imagine from Star Wars to Stranger Things follows the, the hero's journey. And I actually believe the story that we're in when it comes to slavery and supply chains is also a hero's journey where the, for us, in our perspective, the hero is actually the customer, uh, the hero is the companies. Um, and, and they do have a problem. Sometimes a lot of what the work that we're looking at here is helping companies to understand that problem. But the position that we take as a company is, is we're not the hero, we're the guide and our software is the plan that allows them to go out and take action and result in success and, and help them avoid failure. And the, the avoiding failure is a very real thing for companies now um, when it comes to reputation um, or even just being uh, named and shamed in the media, that's real failure. Um, we're seeing where companies who um, kind of take a tick and flick or check the box approach that's getting harder and harder to defend externally, uh, much less internally when it comes to uh, looking at this, uh, at this challenge. But we really focus on what does success look like? What is, what is a well-run, what does a woke supply chain look like? And what are the benefits? I often compare um, supply chains in the way that customers look at spend data as a sock drawer. Um, my sock drawer, it, it's not great. Uh, I don't really always take the time to connect all the socks. Um, for some reason, they never match. The, it, it's, it's like complete pattern disruption. But if you think about a well-run sock drawer, when a sock drawer and everything is matched and ready to go, every morning you are ready to go and you can go out. If you've got black pants on, if you've got 
you've got shorts on, you know exactly what to do. Your day has started well. That when supply chain sock drawers are connected, when everything's measured, that company can run really well. When most sock drawers are just completely disparate and not connected, and that really makes the organization um, suffer. We are living in a supply chain pandemic right now. That is what COVID has shown the world, is the world's sock drawers are not matched. And when it comes time to be able to uh, move quickly, companies are having a hard time doing that. So that's, the, that's the, the business crisis that we're in that also speaks to the crisis that we're talking around, around slavery and supply chains. Next slide. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the slides today, but um, essentially our, our platform's really simple. We, we ingest a uh, company's uh, spend data. So we look at their, the suppliers they're doing business with. We look at what they're buying. We look at where they're buying it from. All that information comes in and our algorithm and our risk platform is able to separate the signal from noise or put the white socks over here and the black socks over here and help a company understand and operationalize where they need to focus most. In a world where oversight dollars and the ability to let's just be honest, uh, measuring supply chains is a cost center, right? So this is not how companies make money. At best, it's where they can save money and save reputation. So for us, we have to be able to help them operationalize and save money to be able to analyze their spend data understand where the risks are in this move the next part of the, the technology that we create Created is we've essentially technology can look into um, uh, uh, can look into the product itself and be able to determine where forced labor is happening not just at the at the top tier the, at the um, at the first tier supplier but all the way down to raw material. So we've built an algorithm that can break down any product. It's built on a on a universal taxonomy called the UNSPSC, and what that does is give our customers a digital bill of material, allowing them to understand where risk might be entering so that they can make the most, the, 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 the taking action in the hero's journey in our part is using one's procurement power, their spend power, the dollar over the barrel, to be able to change behavior in their supply chain. So what's really exciting for us is, you know, we go into every technology is, um, when you're creating technology, you're looking for a job to be done. And new technology typically is trying to create new jobs in the world. So transparency in supply chains is kind of a new job to be done. Um, it's one that's becoming more and more important, but it's not really been super important over the last 10 years. So the job to be done, the organizing of the, of the uh, sock drawer becomes very, very important in order to be able to understand which suppliers can you have the most impact on. If you've got 10,000 suppliers or 20,000 suppliers, you cannot boil the ocean, sorry for that uh, metaphor, but you can't do everything, right? You actually have to be able to look at where you have your most risk, where it's most salient, where it's most proximate, and where you have the greatest amount of spend and impact, and actually use that, that purchasing moment, it's called a sourcing event, use that as a way to be able to change behavior. And we see this every day in our platform where our customers are using their spend data, they're reaching out to their suppliers, they're asking them specific questions, that information comes back, and the suppliers are very engaged in terms of changing their behavior, whether it's policies or grievance mechanisms. Why? Because there's a contract at, 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 that's, at, that's, that's uh, in play. And if they don't do these things, they might not get the contract next time. That's it. It's very simple using spend power to be able to change the behavior inside of contracts. And in a, in a slide really, really far down, um, you can look at it later. Um, there's a Milton Friedman quote. I don't often quote him. I quote him about as often as I quote Stalin, but he talks about how um, essentially only a crisis allows us to change. And we have to, when a crisis happens, we look around at the available tools and that is what allows us to go forward. And for us, we're hoping this, that transparency in supply chains is one of those tools that the world looks around and goes, actually, we do need to operate with transparency. It is in our best interest, not because we should, but because we must in order to run businesses that are operating well, that are protecting workers, and um, that essentially are providing value to our stakeholders and our shareholders. That's us. Thank you, Justin. And um, hopefully we'll be able to figure out the technology so that we can get the entire um, uh, slide deck up.
uh, so that people will be able to see it. Um, Justin um, is the kind of person who's able to say, it's actually really simple um, and um, have you uh, take that hero's journey uh, with him onto a very complex uh, fight. Um, and so it's no surprise, um, and I highly recommend that folks uh, buy it on Amazon or otherwise, but not today because there's uh, Amazon uh, uh, boycott today. Um, the book, uh, A Simple Plan to Change the World uh, by Justin selfish Dillon. Um, a selfish plan, it's not simple. It, a selfish plan. I always say it's a simple plan because you, he always says, it's so simple, we can just do it. Um, yeah. It is selfish and it is simple, but uh, most, most importantly, it's Justin's uh, vision uh, that we're all uh, living in. Um, I wanna ask um, a few questions. We've got the moderator's questions uh, uh, first up now. Um, we're not gonna do a total round robin, um, but we're gonna kind of ask uh, one uh, question per panelist given the time constraints, uh, and then uh, maybe do some targeted follow-up uh, from that. Um, and we've got Allison um, up uh, first. And Allison, <clears throat> I think uh, we were hoping as, as part of the project, um, but also I think as, as people have been able to hear what you're working on and, and everything, if you can uh, walk us through a little bit about how it was that you uh, figured uh, and settled on supply chain transparency um, as the way forward um, and uh, really? what had brought that to you uh, to uh, look at why choose this um, there's a lot of only so much political capital in the world. Um, why choose transparency as opposed to some other aspect uh, of trafficking and slavery, whether it's uh, victim care or um, demand or, or any of those various things? And I think you're muted. Sorry. Um... Yeah, so I think I'm one of actually few, uh, at least the minority in the movement that I that I came to this issue through forced labor and, and labor trafficking. Um, you know, I had grown up working on, in a family that cared a lot about social justice and also came from a lot of, you know, corporate enabled good fortune and, and had grown up with a basic understanding that, um, sorry, my computer seems to be beeping. Um, you know, the, from a responsible company, my, my family is related to Levi Strauss and, and had a sense of pride that, you know, we had been responsible corporate actors, right? They're, they're, you know, whether it related to int integration or domestic partner benefits or a whole host of other things. And then I wound up taking a meeting a friend of mine had asked me to do who talked about, you know, the tens of millions of slaves in the world today um, and started off by talking about cotton and agriculture and mining, which given that I had come from an apparel company meant that I no longer had the distance that that you know Justin and Killian have so expertly helped minimize from what happens over there and and to support my lifestyle. And so I asked for meetings um, with corporations I had access to, and two things came through from those. Right, the the first was that there were a number of companies who were actually engaging responsibly to do the right thing on these issues. And the second was that they were unwilling to just begin talking about them publicly because public awareness was such that if they started coming forward um, with what they were doing to combat forced labor in their supply chain, uh, they would be known as the only people with forced labor or modern slavery in their supply chain. Um, and then thirdly, the time frame with which they were engaging on these issues was kind of whatever felt comfortable. And, and to a person, they all said, of course, if the government acted, we would figure out how to move faster. And I think when you look at the scale of, and this is the last thing I'll say because I really want to hear what everybody else does, but, but one of the things that Ambassador, you and I spoke a lot about 
in in the government, and I think there's corollaries in the corporate sector, right, is you could kind of tell how seriously a government took their responsibility to address this issue based on what cabinet agency they made responsible, right? If it was a money or a justice related cabinet agency, then there was significant heft behind it, but usually it got left in the Ministry of Women and Children with you know, very talented but under-resourced um, actors. And I think we've seen a similar thing in corporations where these issues significantly get relegated to the philanthropies um, or you know, the governmental affairs folks rather than being rightly housed within the supply chain and expecting, you know, at best one to three percent of net profits to be able to you know, counteract what you know hundreds of trillions of dollars globally are incentivizing around the world sets us up to fail and if we instead leveraged the scale at which companies act to do things in the right way we would be much further along I'm up with the next question, and at, at the School of Management here at Yale, we do a lot of cold calling, so uh, Justin, just heads up, this is coming your way. Um, so we're going to stay sort of back in time for a moment and, and ask you to go back in time as well, 10 or 12 years. Um, you've got the film Call and Response. You have an initiative made in the free world uh, where you've built this community of businesses, governments, citizens, all focusing on ending forced and child labor. You've reached 30 million consumers worldwide, and you're working with Allison on, um, and Lou on uh, this legislative effort. What, were, what was the theory of change? What, what was the thought at that time about what this kind of required transparency would do? Was it focused on uh, accelerating consumer action or just give us a sense of where that theory of change thinking was then and then come to the present day where it sounds like you've been focusing a lot on uh, the business and the company as the focus. Uh, sort of what your perception now is about the that theory of change yeah that's a great very cold question um uh, uh look i was uh i was raised by wolves i wasn't socialized in companies i was socialized in rock bands and um uh but when i met allison and lou my biggest talent was counting to four and rhyming um so the the the, but the thing that I, whatever thing that I, I could help bring is, um, you know, there, there is a, when you, when you make a song, um, you, you are looking for a product market fit. And um, it, creating songs or creating movies really have a, a very clear uh, feedback loop. Um, you know immediately if someone uh, agrees with your idea of, of the world and the way that you're presenting it through film or through music, because it's an audience and they respond and it's, it's very visceral and sometimes, um, uh, you know, very humiliating because um, you're dealing with it on stage and seeing that it's not working. Um, so I grew up with a very kind of quick sense of is something working or not? Is there something here? Should we never play this song again? Should I never perform again? Is this film working? What's happening? You know, so very much of kind of a performance metrics um, tied directly to one's soul. Um, so it, the, what, going back and seeing what happened with Slavery Footprint and, and, and one of the other founders and, 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 and key instigators of the Slavery Footprint, Dr. Victoria Ward's on this call as well. And, you know, we found ourselves uh, saying words like econometrics and algorithms and things that just were way, way outside of our pay grade of, of being, or at least my pay grade of being able to um, pull these things together. Um, but it, it, it pattern, it does pattern match with um, that change usually comes from, from the periphery. It doesn't necessarily come from the middle. Um, so new ideas and, and, and disruptive ideas uh, typically come from, from the outside. So those of us that were working on, hmm, 
I wonder if we could tell people how many slaves work for them. Hmm, I wonder if we could help companies understand where slavery is entering their supply chain with the little bit of spend data and the few things that they do know and be able to help them understand that at, at, at a greater. Those ideas are ridiculous. They're absolutely ridiculous to come up with. Um, and they have, they have a high, high, high chance of failing and having tomatoes thrown at them. Um, but when you do kind of step out and, and of course you, you, you put something out in the world and you see a response back that re slavery footprint got back, it was an invitation to, put, to go further. Because there's, you know, when you, you, you do your song, you're doing a movie and it's received well, you're like, I'm gonna keep doing this. This is right, there's something here. I think slavery footprint for what it did is it just kind of opened up a data set that said, there is a lot of will out there. There may not be a lot of way, timing might be weird, but there is something here that needs to be chased. And, and I, in a lot of ways, I feel like um, we're still chasing that. So Killian, you know, as, you, as we think through kind of this idea that the knowledge that the slavery footprint provides or that the transparency law demands and gets that out into the, the fight, how does this approach fit in with the other aspects of the modern anti-trafficking movement? I know that at HU, you've worked on a number of the different parts of the, the movement and with the Attest Coalition and other things that Humanity United has, has done. Um, we've got the three P paradigm of prevention, protection, and prosecution. And I'm wondering if you can talk us through kind of how this complements or distracts from the other parts of the anti-slavery fight, whether it's victim care, uh, immigration issues, civil, criminal uh, enforcement. How does transparency fit in with the rest of this particular human rights fight? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Lou. Um, and I think a lot of us <clears throat> that were advocating for the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act never felt like that law itself was the panacea. It was gonna be the solution, right? But I think what it, what it did do was open up a conversation that just was not happening. I mean, before the Modern Slavery Act in the US uh, or in, in the UK and you know, through Justin's work as well with Slavery Footprint, you could not go to an executive at a company and say like, I wanna talk about forced labor, slavery and supply chain. They would either laugh you out of the room or call, call the police. I definitely remember a, a situation, this is before T, the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act where a large company um, in technology company that had a huge labor violation within one of its suppliers um, hit the news. And I had a connection to the chief, the chief legal officer. And I simply sent an email that said, hey, just wanted to know how you're responding or uh, relating to this. My contact at that time at that company was almost fired for simply giving that person my email. Um, I wasn't accusing the company of doing anything. I wasn't uh, um, bringing a lawsuit. I just simply inquired. That is drastically different than the situation that we're in today. And, and what the California law, I think, fundamentally did has normalized, to Allison's point, has normalized this discussion in which you do now see discussions at the highest level, at the board, at the C-suite level, about just this idea that you have responsibility, not just within your own operations, but within your business relationships and within your supply chain and within, within and amongst your suppliers that extends to things like your purchasing practices, which really does create the environment in which these risks uh, are then manifested in direct supply relationships and then further down the chain. Um, so kind of tying this back to your question, Lou, what this law has done is it has opened up a dialogue in which we as advocates um, or those that are advocates uh, can approach the private sector and discuss and, and bring them into the dialogue either willingly or uh, you know, with them dragging their feet to the table to say like, we need to talk about the extent to which you are fueling and contributing to uh, these global issues related to labor abuse. Um, that was, you know, that was 10 years ago, right? Like that was the conversation that we started 10 years ago. I think what we're beginning now to see, and hopefully this accelerates, uh, is around actually accountability. Um, Allison, I'd love to get your point of view on this in an oral history point of view, but if I remember correctly, part of the reason for why um, the California law was drafted and did not have enforcement mechanism in place was because any laws at that time could not come with them authorization, meaning you could not include it within a funding authorization because California 
was incredibly cast starved after the recession. So any laws that were coming forward within the state assembly, they were not going through if they had earmarked attached to them. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened now is that people have used the modern slavery law in California and they've replicated a fundamental flaw that was contextual for why we pushed it the way we did. So you don't have that enforcement mechanism. You don't have the ability to hold companies accountable for what they're doing because a lot of these laws are based on a flaw that was contextual for California and for the time. We need to see that change. Like these laws, they create the environment in which reporting happens, but they do not themselves create an environment in which companies can be held accountable. And all, those advocates, at least that I know that were pushing for the law, weren't pushing for it as the panacea, but we're saying like, this is a pragmatic approach to get this conversation going. And now we're setting the stage to accelerate these dialogues around accountability and really attributing business decisions for the risks that they actually create. Uh, hear me? Yeah, that's the perfect uh, setup, uh, Killian, for the, the question I was going to direct to to Allison next. Um, uh, we have a question from the audience from Bernadette Bruton, who's asking, um, you know, could something like this be possible in, in another state like Massachusetts? Do you know of any efforts in Massachusetts? And um, so, you know, this is a time when there's a, there's a renewed focus now on legislation. We have um, the World Economic Forum saying this crisis is a, a litmus test for stakeholder capitalism and for our current models of corporate regulation, which are primarily self-regulation or voluntary commitments. And they're advocating for, um, you know, a much more stronger set of legal obligations. So given that there's interest from the audience about thinking about the legislative process in a different state or renewed call for legislation, can you reflect on what was that process like? What were some of the challenges? Um, did it sail through? Uh, did the business community um, get very involved? Uh, Tell us a little bit about that uh, sausage making part of the of the legislative process. Yeah, so I, I think the funniest part in retrospect about that process is I remember having a call with a lobbyist um, for the California Manufacturers Association at that time, which I actually felt like would be the easiest lift because these were people who manufactured in California and theoretically at least, right? This would, this would have created a more even playing field for them because there's probably more regulation around manufacturing in California than, el than elsewhere. And I was talking to the lobbyist on the phone and, and I said, I don't understand why you think this is overly burdensome. All, all people have to do is say what they're doing and it requires injunctive relief to, and Killian's, Killian's recollection on all of that is correct. And, and the lobbyist said, our concern with this bill is if we have to disclose what our practices are and whether they're independently audited, it will lay bare other places we're breaking the law. <laughs> and I thought, well, I, I can't really help you with that. Um, I think the consistent pushback that we have gotten on every major policy, you know, reform that we have pushed in this movement is, you know, first that, you know, whatever remedy we're, we're promoting isn't nimble enough to address the unique complexities of different businesses and different businesses at scale. Um, you know, it's why I think the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is, is an interesting model to look at going forward because it did that and did that well. And the other is, you know, kind of an urge to start with step functions that I think conscribe our ability to be effective over the long term. So, you know, invariably when people first enter into this issue or corporations, there's kind of a push to start where it's worst, whether that is geographically or by industry. Um, and one of the things that I'm proudest of is that we really did geographically by industry, or I would say by tier. And, and one of the things that we have worked on 
I think because especially related to modern slavery and slavery in general, the, you know, this process has always been marked by people being told to wait their turn. Um, and I think we will see this again with COVID, right? This is an emergency. We can't focus on human rights within the context of an emergency. And, and I just think that's fundamentally wrong related to this. So we were, have always been really insistent that, that the reforms have to go all the way down the supply chain. Um, and that the reality is insofar as modern slavery and forced labor is everywhere, they need to be applicable everywhere. Um, and, and I think that's important to carry forward. And again, there's a, a balancing challenge to both hold that truth and also ensure as we're moving policy reforms forward, not every policy proposal can encapsulate every good thing that we would want to see. Um, and get through in our current environment. Um, but, but I do think, you know, I, I love listening to Justin and I think Justin is, is, you know, just categorically wonderful. And I, when he talked about, um, you know, measuring supply chain being a cost center, I kind of winced and then I thought, he's not wrong, right? He, that's true. And, and I think the reality is to get this right and to get this to boring and to get this to transformational, it's going to take government to move the incentives around that from cost center to a capital investment that's absolutely necessary for business practices. Thank you, Allison. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we've seen is that, you know, the journey that uh, each of you took over the years uh, from somebody who'd first learned about slavery still existing to figuring out how you could harness your own experiences, your own interests, both locally in California, but then globally as well. And the new, uh, for lack of a better word, the new vocabulary of abolition uh, that I'm hearing uh, from the three of you, things like procurement, opacity, arbitrage, incentivized, purchasing practice, operationalism, resilience, those are not necessarily the words and the conversations that certainly the four of us had 10 years ago when we were thinking about these things. Uh, but maybe it takes us into a new direction. Uh, and that new direction, I think, uh, we're going to uh, wrap up the moderator questions uh, at this point. And I know that that new direction is something that Genevieve uh, LeBaron, our commentator, has been uh, really thinking about and really studying. So I'm going to hand it back over to David, uh, our host. And uh, I think Kate and I will start looking at some questions uh, from the audience. David, I think you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Lou. I'm back. Forgive me. Um, I just want I just was saying that uh, the intellectual sizzle and personal passion of each of our panelists uh, is just extraordinary. And we're all grasping for um, modes of hope in this crisis. Uh, Killian, I can't wait to talk some May Day, Labor Day with you. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, where the UAW never, never let us forget the connection of that. Allison, I, want, I may have some comment at the end about George Washington and American contradictions, if there's time. And uh, uh, I, I can't wait to talk more about story, uh, uh, Justin, story. I'm a storyteller, too. That's what this is about. But I'm thrilled now to quickly introduce Genevieve LeBaron, a dear friend of the Gilder Lerman Center. She spent a full year here as a fellow, uh, one of our modern slavery fellows uh, some three, four years ago. She's professor of politics and co-director of the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute in Sheffield, England. Uh, she was co-chair of the Gilder Lerman Center's Working Group on Modern Slavery, which was an international group of scholars and activists. 
who met for two years, and that group is indeed about to publish a, a book of essays from that group. Um, since about 2008, uh, she's, been, she's become one of the world's leading experts on forced labor and global supply chain. She has done, like our other guests here today, some heroic uh, field work with the team, particularly in the tea plantations of India and other places. She's the author of at least four books or, or editor of at least four books, including Combating Modern Slavery, Why Labor Governance is Failing. Uh, she's the author of a book on methodologies and researching forced labor and is co-editor of the new book coming out um, soon from Cambridge University Press, Fighting Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking, um, co-edited with Jessica Plyley, and I guess I'm a co-editor there as well. Um, anyway, Genevieve, welcome. Uh, we could not have a better person to bring us uh, some sense of the scope of this whole discussion. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Genevieve. Welcome. Thanks, David. Uh, really such a kind introduction. Thanks for having me on this really lovely panel. Uh, in honor of our hosts, I have made my Zoom background uh, the Yale Divinity School Library. Uh, because that was one of my favorite places to hide away and write during my fellowship at Yale. Um, and I just want to say how tremendously grateful I am uh, for the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. Um, I mean, personally, what David and Lou and the colleagues at GLC have done for, for my work and scholarship, but also really for the academic community researching forced labor, slavery, and trafficking more generally. Um, such an important contribution. And so it's really an honor to be here today with you all. Um, also, just a quick shout out to the workers who are mobilizing today as part of May Day. Um, it's really important that we pay attention to what workers are doing, to what they're asking for, to the solutions they're proposing. Uh, and I think today we see a number of initiatives that really show us the way forward on some of these important um, issues that we're talking about. Really fascinating to hear from Allison and Killian and, and Justin, the reflections on transparency legislation and the roles that they personally and their organizations have played in bringing about this really important shift in the governance of supply chains. And I think it is important to, to realize um, you know, that this is a big shift. It, it wasn't there before this legislation uh, came about and it has made some impacts. Um, and it's important to take stock of those um, before I get into the really bad news about maybe what it hasn't done, I'll just make that clear. I think it is, you know, there are some real positives there. Um, in my brief commentary, I, I would like to talk about three things. I think first, I'd like to just look quickly at what some of the recent research says about the effectiveness of transparency legislation as a tool um, in driving change that would be necessary to eradicate forced labor in supply chains. And then I wanna just reflect briefly about transparency in the age of COVID, uh, pulling together some of the themes that came up in the, in the contributions. Um, and I think really pushing the panelists and the discussion at the end um, more into the, these questions around, you know, what do we need to be thinking about as we rebuild uh, supply chains and strengthen corporate accountability that are so desperately needed right now. Uh, and finally, I'll end just by posing a few questions to the panelists. So to begin, I want to um, do what academics do and bring in some evidence and research um, about the effectiveness of transparency as a tool to change corporate behavior and especially to change the types of business practices that lead to risk around forced labor. Um, I'm eager to hear the panelists reflect on some of this research um, at, at, in the Q&A. So as Kate mentioned at the very beginning, you know, we're five years on now from the implementation of the UK Modern Slavery Act. We're 10 years on from the California Transparency Act. Um, and what that means um, from an academic point of view is that it's an apt moment to start to look at evidence about the effectiveness of these pieces of legislation. There have been many different studies of effectiveness and I think we're just now at the point where we can start looking at some data and asking, has this led to concrete change on the ground in terms of worker exploitation, in terms of forced labor and the patterns of forced labor in supply chains? Um, I think, unfortunately, for all of the excitement about 
this legislative strategy that we would have um, transparency legislation and it would combat extreme forms of exploitation in supply chains, there's actually very little evidence to support the idea that it has spurred meaningful changes in corporate behavior. Uh, the sorts of changes that lead to improvements for workers on the ground, especially the most vulnerable workers in the sub tiers of supply chains uh, who enter the supply chains often through informal uh, labor subcontracting or are sometimes provided by labor providers, but the specific groups of workers who are vulnerable to forced labor, when we get down to them and their portion of the supply chain, we're not necessarily seeing the types of change we'd want, we'd want to be seeing to feel like this is making a real impact. Um, I recently did a study of effectiveness of 17 different pieces of transparency legislation um, with two colleagues, Nicola Phillips and Sarah Vallon. It was published by the ILO. Um, and I just mentioned it to mention that I think effectiveness does vary across the legislative models. Um, it's not all the same. And I think different pieces of legislation have been more effective than others, notably types that have penalties and enforcement provisions um, which was something that came up just in the, in, in the panel discussion. Um, but I think for the sake of brevity, I'll just mention three problems that cut across this whole body of legislation. In the first case, I think as it stands, transparency legislation gives companies pretty free reign to choose what they report on um, or whether they report at all. So civil society coalition in the UK called CORE um, they figured out that about 12,000 12, to 17,000 companies are within the scope of the Modern Slavery Act uh, here. And last year, they did a study that found that just over 6,000 companies had published a statement on, on their website, uh, the Modern Slavery Registry website. So basically, to put it simply, there's about a 50% compliance rate with the basic requirement of the act. Uh, many of the statements that have been published are very low quality. And they found that a significant number of them don't even satisfy the requirements of the act. And similar studies have found very similar things. Um, as mentioned, there's usually no financial or legal penalty for non-compliance with transparency legislation. And there's very little evidence that suggests that consumers are using company statements or the data produced through this legislation uh, to inform their purchasing decisions. So I think that that is the first cause for for reflection on how effective um, some of this legislation has been so far. In the second case, uh, I think it's pretty clear from the studies that have been done that companies that are reporting are rarely reporting on the issues that matter most in relation to forced labor, human trafficking, and modern slavery. So a lot of the statements, when you look at them, what do they focus on? Well, philanthropic activities, partnerships with NGOs, policies that they've said about forced labor, like codes of conduct, um, a lot of them focus on private initiatives to monitor compliance, social auditing. Uh, a lot of the statements talk about increasing social auditing as the main strategy to try to tackle forced labor. Um, ethical certification schemes, voluntary multi-stakeholder initiatives, those are the types of things companies are reporting on is the action that they're taking to address forced labor and supply chains. But the problem is that if we look across most of those initiatives, you know, there's almost no evidence that says that these initiatives are actually effective when it comes to tackling the worst forms of worker exploitation. Um, there's actually a growing body of academic research that suggests um, that many of these initiatives, especially ethical certification and private auditing, are ineffective tools to detect forced labor. They're ineffective, or they're ineffective in terms of corrective action and remediation. Um, and so reporting on the fact that they're doing these initiatives really provides no guarantee um, that labor conditions will be any better in a supply chain. I'll just give you two really quick examples here. The first is a major study by Cornell University that was released this week. They looked at 31,000 um, plus factory audits in China and India over a seven year period. They found that half of these audits, over half, were based on falsified information, just purely falsified information. Their full data set included 11 other countries as well. And across that whole data set, the average unreliability was about 45%. So crudely put, social auditing is just picking up um, inaccurate, uh, it's giving misleading portraits of what's going on with respect to workers uh, on work sites. Um, 
The second example comes from my own research, which is on the tea industry. I looked at the effectiveness of ethical certification, like Fair Trade Rainforest Alliance, on forced labor um, through interviews with about 600 workers across many different ethically certified and non-ethically -eth certified work sites. And my research found that um, labor standards and conditions were almost identical across plantations uh, that had ethical certification versus plantations that didn't. And that included prevalence and severity of forced labor. So when it comes to this data from the ground, um, you know, even though these practices and these suppliers often are in these um, work supply chains that have been covered by transparency legislation for quite a long time, they've been covered by CSR initiatives, corporate social responsibility initiatives for quite a long time. Consumers are often paying more for these products thinking that there are more ethical labor practices associated. And the reality is, you know, when we look at labor standards on the ground and prevalence of forced labor data, we're just not seeing, you know, the change um, and the difference that we'd, we'd hope to see. And finally, just as a third problem to mention with transparency, there's increasing um, interest among the research community um, in looking at how, like whether transparency does anything really to tackle the underlying root causes that give rise to forced labor and supply chains. I was really intrigued, Justin, by your, um, your point that, you know, the problem is about lacking technology um, and, and visibility, that that's a big issue here. And I, I agree with you, but I also, I guess I worry that um, even when companies have the, right, have the right information and they have the right data, I think a lot of people within those companies face big challenges in getting their company to do the right thing. Companies that I've worked with have told me that, you know, even where they have the data, that there's clear risks, um, even when they know what the risks are, if changing business practices cuts up against price, cuts up against shareholder returns, bottom lines, um, then a lot of that is off the table. So I worry that, you know, when, when we're looking at these business practices, transparency legislation doesn't in itself change them. It doesn't dismantle business models that are predicated on the use of forced labor. Uh, it doesn't disrupt kind of the status quo that leads to forced labor in supply chains. So I think we need to look at what transparency has actually done. It's led to this flurry of activity, promising, interesting activity um, in, in some ways. But when we look at whether it spurred meaningful changes in terms of actually improving conditions for workers. I don't think there's that much of a basis for optimism yet. Um, I think one of the key reasons here, we can talk more about it in the Q&A, but at the moment, you know, most transparency legislation, it doesn't require uh, companies to report on the effectiveness of their efforts to tackle forced labor. It just requires them to report on their efforts, whatever they may be, even if they're not doing anything. Um, and the problem is a lot of the efforts that companies are choosing just are well documented not to really work when it comes to the most vulnerable workers in supply chains. Um, so moving on to our current moment, just really briefly, I think that this pandemic we're in, you know, as was has kind of come up throughout the panel, and I'd like to encourage the panelists to to take this forward in the discussion, the reflections on these issues, but. Um, is, is the pandemic kind of making the fault lines of transparency and some of the Achilles heels of these softer, more voluntary forms of corporate governance more obvious than ever? Um, you know, for decades, we've been told voluntary corporate social responsibility will be sufficient to ensure human rights and labor standards are met in supply chains. Some supply chains like garments have been covered for 20 plus years by those types of initiatives. Um, and yet our, our current moment, I think, raises some pretty fundamental questions about that whole approach. Um, at the moment when it's mattered the most, you know, when workers have, have been put, you know, put in the, the, the line, as many of us have in a pandemic where their, their health and safety and other things are on the line, uh, their, their livelihoods, their sources of subsistence, uh, you've had really wealthy corporations just abandoning suppliers, as I think was mentioned at the beginning, defaulting on financial obligations, not paying businesses in their supply chains, refusing to pay for orders, leaving workers completely destitute. And I think the key point I would just like to throw into this discussion for folks to reflect on is that these companies have 
uh, money in the bank. They're claiming government bailout funds, um, you know, but still they're kind of using suppliers as shock absorbers of this crisis and prioritizing shareholders and executive pay over workers in their supply chain. And the consequences for workers, you know, it is a life and death thing in many cases. Um, workers are being left without wages that they're owed. Uh, they're facing acute risk of hunger and starvation. We're also seeing companies take advantage of this crisis to retaliate against um, uh, workers who have mobilized. So we've seen whole unions be fired. We've seen um, retaliation against people who have uh, been fighting for labor rights. And I think the Workers' Rights Consortium has done some great work on this. So I'd like to just raise in this commentary the question of whether the pandemic is, you know, whether this is new, is, are these forms of irresponsibility new? Are these forms of kind of crisis along the supply chain new? Or are they simply exposing cracks that were there in the system? Um, is, you know, is this in fact what supply chains are kind of set up to do, allow companies to cut and run, minimize liability, minimize obligation to suppliers and workforces, and if so, then what does transparency do, you know, to alter that status quo? Um, so I think when we're talking about rebuilding a freer world and thinking about the, the role and place of transparency within that, um, we need to really think carefully about, you know, what, what has happened at this moment of stress in the system um, and cracks uh, that are emerging and whether these are really related to the pandemic or whether they just sort of bring to the four dynamics that have been there all along. Um, and just to wrap up then, I'd like the panelists to reflect on two, two things. The first one, um, I think that's where we were heading and, and indeed it, during the, the previous discussion just before I, I came on, uh, we were really getting into it. You know, does transparent supply chains equal slavery-free supply chains? Um, and if not, how do we get there? So Kellyanne started to share some really important thoughts on this. Um, I think we've heard a few times transparency legislation is a first step. I'd love to hear the panelists and indeed even the moderators thoughts um, on what else is really needed to build on this first step. You know, what's gonna, what's gonna get us change on the ground? Um, and second, just to be even more provocative, I would just ask whether the panelists think it's possible for us to eliminate forced labor and supply chains as long as dominant business models remain intact. You know, um, in academia, uh, there's a lot of writing about how the very purpose and advantage for corporations of producing goods through supply chains, instead of doing it locally in an integrated company, um, is that they give companies at the top of the, the supply chain the power to demand extremely cheap goods, to cut and run when they don't get their way, um, and the, the way that supply chains are set up kind of hardwires risks of forced labor into global production. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on whether and how that might be addressed. Are we ever going to get a corporate governance regime that's going to really fundamentally change that? And if so, what would it look like? Um, or is it that actually the, the system that we have is kind of set up to produce uh, these outcomes? And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, wow. Uh, thank you so much, Genevieve. Uh, so much to think about. I'm going to turn it right over to Kate and to Lou to pose some questions. We've had Song Kim and a team here curating a host of questions that have come out, come from people all over the world. And um, so go for it, folks. We have, we have a good deal of time left. Um, well, before we, um, I think, bring in one of the questions from the the audience, um, which uh, Killian, prepare yourself, it's gonna be for you. Um, maybe, um, Justin, if you could um, uh, address the, what uh, Genevieve raised about whether uh, and how we look at the cracks in the system uh, through this particular issue and through COVID, because I think that you've had some recent experiences that might speak directly to that. And you are muted. Right now, Got it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, look, the number one rule in building a movement is that understanding that followers follow followers; they don't follow leaders. Um, and so, you, you, it's important to look <laughs> for the helpers and those that are operating in the way that you want the world to go. 
Um, it's, it can be very overwhelming to see all the things that are wrong. Um, that's why we that's why we focus on on what's right, and you get behind that and you serve that. And that's that is the number one rule for us as a company and as the helper in the hero's journey is to is to serve and to help. Because um, we can't we're not the ones. There's I don't know something like twenty five billion dollars that we get to influence with our little tech company um, in the in the procurement space, and it's our job to make sure that we help people, including a chief procurement officer that emailed me from Australia. She runs a supply chain for an aged care company, a publicly traded aged care company, um, emailed me directly at midnight um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, right when all this was happening and said, hey, I need to source some gloves from Southeast Asia and uh, we need gloves. <laughs> I'm, I'm adding my part, my part in the narrative here. We need gloves to save lives. And as we all know, as many of us know, um, sourcing gloves um, right now has been a, a challenge around forced labor. And this chief procurement officer from an aged care company knew enough to reach out to us and say, can you help me find the right supplier? I have to buy this quickly, but I wanna make sure I'm doing the right thing. You know what? I wouldn't have faulted her one second for not thinking about that during that time. That is her number one job was to get gloves to save lives. But on top of that, she was thinking about sourcing them ethically and making sure she was doing the right thing. It's a data point that I think we should, we should be paying attention to because I guarantee you she wasn't thinking that way a year ago. And that's not due to just freedom and, and what we're doing in our company, but it is due to the fact that a hero was looking for a tool and looking for a way to do the right thing and to take action. And in the midst of battle, was wanting to, to fight the good fight. And I think it's a, it's a lesson for all of us to remember that you know, that finding the heroes and, and getting behind them is really the way to be able to create a movement. Well, and I think it also can't be divorced from the, the passage of the Australian Modern Slavery Act, which as with the UK Modern Slavery Act, as with the, the transparency uh, legislation in California has omissions, flaws, unrealized hopes and dreams. But at the end of the day, it's that first step that is, is motivating some folks in Australia. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things we haven't necessarily heard as much about though, is we, you know, we're talking about companies, corporate social responsibility, we're talking about governments, regulators, how effective they are, how effective transparency legislation is. We've talked about transparency legislation to some degree as though it's a tool for the academy or as it's a tool for activists or investors and we haven't really necessarily talked about transparency legislation and how it fits into what the workers themselves are doing and i think that that's something that uh, very much needs to be done we had a couple of questions that really go uh, to killian i think um, although they were teed up by everyone uh, killian you had mentioned the grievance mechanisms in the and how many of them were not being either used or put in place to begin with. And I guess one of the questions that it teed up for somebody who didn't share their name, but also uh, is suggestive of what Alicia Shivi um, had suggested, um, what about the role of workers beyond grievance mechanisms? Not simply raising their hands and saying, I'm being abused, but what type of models are out there, whether it's uh, the worker-led social responsibility model or others, um, beyond even uh, just the, the kind of labor union, industrial labor relations model of the last hundred years? What are you seeing out there as far as worker voice that's actually real worker voice and not some kind of a greenwashing exercise? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lou. Um, and thanks, Genevieve, for your, your provocative question and to really focus and center a discussion that has happened on the fringes of our movement, but needs to be happened in the center. And I think it really calls a question for me, uh, in this moment of crisis, what do we want to take forward? What is maintained? What needs to be renovated? And what needs to be dismantled? I think those are fundamental questions. Uh, and just, Lou, as you framed it around organized labor, let's, let's rewind 100 years ago when the ILO was originally created. The ILO was created <clears throat> not to deal with and manage global supply chains. There is not an ILO convention that deals with global supply chains. And, and so fundamentally, um, a lot of these laws, whether they're transparency and reporting, whether they're mandatory human rights due diligence, 
These are all different frameworks that are emerging to try and respond to a fundamental flaw, which was that our current institutions and structures were not set up for the world that we're in today. And so I think it does behoove us to have this discussion. And to Genevieve's point, uh, a lot of these reporting laws, companies are not talking about effectiveness. They're not talking about um, the things that they, they really should be, which is about what are the conditions on the ground and how are workers impacted. Um, these laws and, and the intention around the movement originally 10 years ago was not explicitly to say this is the end all be all. And I think we need to realize that um, as much as reporting laws are a check the box exercise for companies sometimes, having a law on the books became a, a check the box exercise for some governments as well, in which they just said, hey, how do we just copy paste this maybe change it a little bit, but not fundamentally ask the question as to whether or not these laws have been affected. And so I think Genevieve, your research and others is really important to fuel this conversation about what is more effective. Um, now to get to your question, Lou, and I'll, I'll tie this up neatly, hopefully. Um, is there, there has been surprising, to, I mean, exciting developments, not recently, but going back 20 years, starting with the Coalition of Mockley Workers, that really tested out these systems of holding companies accountable through binding agreements, right? The, the, the need for that has been accelerated and we're seeing a lot of uh, disheartening developments in countries like Bangladesh, in the Gulf, but there's also hopefully an opportunity to, to again center this discussion and say what does it mean to have agreements in place that in some way in, include a binding mechanism, whether it's an individual brand agreement which really holds accountable an individual company, or if it's sectoral agreements such as what's, what ACT is pushing, to say how do we create a level playing field for an entire sector where we ensure that there's fair play and competition for the businesses, as well as ensuring that there's basic fundamental worker rights and protections in place. Those are the type of discussions that we need to be having as we look forward. Uh, and we can talk about you know, different remedy mechanisms and different technology approaches. Uh, and there are those promising developments that are emerging, but we cannot div divorce that from these real structural and system systemic changes that need to occur to create that level playing field in the first place for those technologies to be effective to really drive what we want to, to drive, which is ensure that workers are actually protected and ensure that slavery or other egregious labor abuses are not occurring at any tier of the supply chain. I want to um, bring Allison into the conversation. And Allison, I think, you know, in your, in your slides, you, you began almost with a response to the critique by, uh, by Genevieve talking about the lack of, of enforcement with your suggestion that uh, we could learn a lot from the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So I wondered if you wanted to pick up <clears throat> that theme of uh, what, what kind of mechanisms that are in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act might help address the shortcomings um, that the really important research that Genevieve and her colleagues have done in this space and is that problem of visibility going to hamper even um, the stronger mechanisms that we might see in in the For Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I guess I'm not totally sure I buy the visibility argument, right? I, I think we have seen time and time again that where visibility impacts a company's bottom line they find it right you know we've talked about arbitrage across the board in you know globalized supply chains continuing to improve their skill sets and becoming more and more nimble to adjust operations to know what they need to know I, the ambassador and i when we were in the State Department, you know, visited a frozen food um, processing plant in East Asia. And as I was kind of flipping through all of the different companies that they were sourcing within the United States, it became very clear that they, it was shrimp related, that they could trace to you know, specified areas of the pond of where those shrimp were sourced, because if there was a health outbreak, they, would need, they wouldn't want to have to pause the entire supply chain. They'd just like to you know, section off that portion of the pond. And I think where we have failed is to establish similar mechanisms that protect human rights. So, I, you know, and, and our good friends at the Solidarity Center will frequently point out, right, as 
as companies are continuing to outsource to reduce costs in places where labor, where those costs are likely reduced because labor regulations are not as robust, there is more responsibility on both the corporations and uh, you know the, the governments where companies are headquartered. So I think the promise of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and and other mechanisms within it are, um, you know, one, we have got to get to increase governmental responsibility for supply chains that extend beyond their own physical borders. Two, I think we have to, we have to figure out, and, and the upshot of this horrible crime is it's financially incentivized, right? And so I think too often, both in the private sector and certainly in the public sector, we look at enforcement mechanisms around this as being cost prohibitive, when in reality, if we were able to leverage, as I think the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act does well, fines associated with the profits around this as a disincentive, you can actually have a cost neutral or a cost positive um, you know, enforcement mechanism employed that, that builds back resources and value for the public interest and corporations that are responsibly honoring their supply chains. So I think, you know, that holds throughout. And I would just end by saying, I think there's a particular leverage point right now with what we see as the biggest I, I, stimulus and kind of government expenditures and subsidies for corporations that hopefully we will see within our lifetime. Um, and, and the question I think before all of us is whether that money is going to be used to incentivize further bad practice. And there are some you know, early signs that that is absolutely true or whether that money can move us much forward and put in conditionality around worker treatment and enforcement and protections um, and that I think really matters to building back to, you know, a, a place that is fairer and freer. I think we could take one more conglomerate question if it's succinct and then we'll have to do a wrap up if you want. You've had a lot of questions out there. <laughs> uh, well, I think maybe the conglomerate question that we might want to do is a very quick speed round, um, which is um, if you could, pick up a, a time phone and call your 15 years ago self um, and uh, ha who is working on the California legislation uh, and tell them something about what uh, was going to end up with all of this. Uh, what would you uh, say on that phone call? Um, why don't we start with uh, Justin and we'll go to, to Killian and then Allison. Uh, what I'd say to my 15 year old self? Not 15 year old, 15 years ago. Same question though, same thing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, get comfortable with your imposter syndrome because it's the only space in which you can create change from. Mm. Killian? Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, get more sleep, but uh, I would say don't forget the role of the investors in capital markets in incentivizing a lot of this behavior. Now, whether or not that led to legislative change, it would be more of just continuing to focus and realize that to really meet, bring back meaningful change, you cannot leave out capital markets and investors. Allison. Um, I, I think there's value in ensuring that there is greater connectivity between you know, the anti-modern slavery movement and the broader human rights and corporate accountability movement and, and making sure that we don't inadvertently undercut each other and moving forward for progress. Indeed. So two quick things. First of all, I do want to point out, um, based on uh, that story that Allison was telling uh, about the sh us and the shrimp, um, that those were shrimp producers and that was a Thai government that had told us as the United States that it was impossible to trace the shrimp the way that we were suggesting. That there's no way that you could link it to the slavery on a particular boat because it was impossible. And then we looked over and we saw that they were doing it and they were doing it for a different part of the US government. 
because of food safety reasons. And so I think one of the things that um, I certainly hope that we have, and I know that we've got uh, some colleagues from uh, the Homeland Security uh, who have been uh, very uh, good on this and uh, that the Tariff Act uh, that has, was something that we worked so hard on in the Obama administration to get change, that that is something that is coming online as a, a new tool. And I think the hope is that transparency is not simply um, a way to have corporate social responsibility or a feel-good exercise for the civil sectors, but rather that when we catch companies, countries, or bosses lying in the future, now that we've mandated that they file disclosures, that enforcement then follows. The hope, of course, is that that provides some teeth that can be accessed by workers and those who care about them. Speaking of workers and those who care about them, we got a lot of great questions and we are going to try to keep working on responding to them. We'll let you know exactly what form that response takes, but uh, Kate and I and, and the panelists and, and all of us, um, I think we'll continue to try to do that. It may end up being on the GLC website. Uh, it may be that we reach out directly. Uh, please watch this space and we'll keep you informed. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to our distinguished host, David Black. Uh, thank you, Lou and Kate, for moderating this. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, I want to do a brief uh, in memoriam, if I might, for just a minute. Uh, Lou uh, DeBaca has provided this information. Uh, we're all living through a time of enormous collective uh, mourning uh, because of the COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic. Uh, two uh, major figures in this field of anti-slavery work have just died in the past couple of weeks. Um, so today we want to remember um, the anti-slavery activists we've lost. And again, I thank Lou for giving me this information. One is Maeve McCain, who was crucial to the Obama administration's victim service response program which ensured that the Department of Health and Human Services focused on survivors' needs rather than governmental uh, turf battles. And the second person is, is the civil rights prosecutor who Lou worked with, Holly Weissman, who indicted the first case under the U.S. Trafficking Victims Protection Act in the year 2000, which updated the post-Civil War slavery statutes and help bring that model to Eastern Europe. Um, Maeve and Holly worked on behalf of the unnamed and unseen. It is altogether fitting and proper that we commemorate them and continue the unfinished work that they nobly began. And again, I thank Lou for providing me with that information. I wanna thank uh, again my amazing team here at the Gilder Lehrman Center, Michelle Zacks, Melissa McGrath, uh, behind the scenes here, you didn't meet them, and Daniel and Song for working so hard on, on all this technology. And as some of you know, I am sometimes want to quote Frederick Douglass, when in need. It's basically the motto of my life, when in doubt, quote Douglass, and you can go anywhere. Um, uh, t t two lines from Douglas. Uh, this goes to the point that was made here, I believe by Justin, could have been Killian, could have been all of you, um, that crises are that which you hope to use, uh, you hope to learn from. Tragedy, indeed, the oldest definition we have of tragedy is that experience from which we might, might be instructed as Melville said about the American Civil War, how will this instruct us? This is what Douglas said, it's brief, uh, in the depth of the crisis of the Civil War. This was in the bloodiest year actually of American history, 1864. He said, and he took hope from this, believe it or not, he said, quote, the most hopeful fact of the hour is that we are now in a salutary school the school of affliction. If sharp and signal retribution, long protracted and overwhelming, can teach a great nation respect for justice, surely we will be taught now and for all time to come. 
he took hope in that uh, bloodiest year of American history that um, transformative change was to come from it. Um, we can perhaps take some hope too. And then there's this little line that Douglas wrote about his own experience as a slave. And it, and it just occurred to me when I saw the pictures that Allison, Justin and Killian all showed, especially of those kids, those children, those young people, that girl sitting on the mica pile, uh, that guy by that little, that man by the mines, uh, this was, this was Douglas, he said, uh, remembering his time as a, as a slave, as a child slave. I would, if I could, he said, make visible the wounds of this system upon my soul. Well, there are millions of those kids uh, and workers out there now newly vulnerable. They don't have any voice. Um, our panelists here today and many others like them, in numerous organizations, uh, sometimes inside the academy, but often outside, are trying to give voice um, to those who cannot uh, tell their own story. And as uh, Justin so ably said, this is about a story. It's about a story that can persuade. And as Genevieve pointed out, this is not easy. A lot of people are not persuaded. A lot of people in corporations are not persuaded. A lot of people in the public are not persuaded. But uh, as you can tell from this group, uh, and uh, I can assure you here at the Guild and Lehrman Center, we're never gonna stop trying. Uh, thanks again to all of you. Thanks to the Macmillan Center for helping support this and to fund this project that Kate and Lou are, are directing. And thanks to all of our audience out there for joining us and uh, have a great Friday uh, across the world and uh, good luck, stay healthy. Bye-bye.